Hi, my name is Dave Copeland and today I want to talk to you about algorithmic bias. Now back in October, the BBC ran a really interesting story about a problem that some researchers had found in the algorithms being used in the UK Passport Office's website. Now this is an algorithm that basically when you submit a digital copy of your passport photo, uh, you know, there's a, a, a number of basic checks. Are your eyes open or you smile? I mean, God forbid you should smile on your passport photo, right? And what the researchers found is that there are a disproportionate number of people who had dark skin and were female being rejected than uh, people who had light skin and were male. The algorithm them was biased. And the thing is, what you have to understand, number one, is this is just the latest in a long line of, of really big examples of bias in algorithms. And these are the things that we use every single day. And secondly, we've got to start to understand these issues, you know, not just the tech companies, but ourselves as individuals. Given the extent to which algorithms surround and support our everyday lives, these are the things that will prevent us from getting the kind of value that we need. Now, if you want to know more about this specific issue about facial recognition algorithms and uh, skin tone, then you can do no better than to look up this lady, a lady called Joy Bulamwini, who's doing some amazing work at MIT Media Lab. Her video, Gender Shades, is based specifically on addressing this issue and talking it through. So look, if we want to solve this problem, the first thing, we've got to look in the right place, right? So we talk about a, an algorithm being biased. Well, actually, that's not strictly true. The algorithm, I, I want you to understand, is the engine, right? So the engine itself is not biased, but the fuel for which that we're powering the engine through, which is the data that we use to train the algorithm, that's where the problem lies. We're putting in bad fuel, and as a result, we're getting bad performance out of the algorithm. So. What is the role of data when it comes to algorithms? Well, if you want to understand that, we have to go a little bit deeper into how algorithms work. The first thing to understand is unlike a traditional computer, right? A traditional computer requires code, instructions, line by line. I have to tell you the computer specifically, explicitly what I need it to do. And if I fail in any one of those lines of code, the computer will fail in its task. This is not true for an algorithm. With an algorithm, it's a bit like my kids, right? I'm basically training it. And every time the algorithm does the thing that I want them to do, the thing that I've trained them to do, I give them a little reward. I give them a little merit stick. I give them 10 points, right? And the, the way this is important is the data that we're using to train them, this performs the patterns through which the algorithm uh, performs. And look, it's very sim similar to the way that we learn as human beings, the whole sort of way that the pattern formation. There's some lovely research that shows this. And before we go to the research, I want you to cast your minds back when you were learning English at school. And do you remember how they used to teach us English at school? And it was all about the logic of language and it was the rules of language. And they would teach us things like I before E except after C. What they didn't also teach us is that actually there are 923 exceptions to the I before. There are more exceptions to the I before E rule than there are to the bloody rule itself. Language, it turns out, isn't logical. It doesn't follow rules. It follows patterns. And we innately know this as human beings because from the day we learn to read until the day we die, we create, curate, and tend to our own personal pattern of language. Every time we read something, we're making our own personal pattern of language slightly better. Now, this sort of pattern recognition behavior was demonstrated in some research from Cambridge University in the late 90s that basically showed that if you speak English, and actually if you don't speak English, the same thing will work in whatever is your native language. As long as I keep the first and last characters of the word in the right place, I can mix up all of the other characters. I can even misspell words and you'll still be able to read the text. So can you read the text on this? Of course you can. And what's happening when your brain gets presented with some, something as ambiguous as this slide, it's not calling on the rules, it's not calling on the logic of your language, it's basically calling on the pattern that you yourself has created every time you've read something. The other reason why this is a great example for explaining both the benefits and also the limitations of algorithms is think about what happens when you don't have enough data, right? Think about what would happen if I showed this slide to someone who's just beginning to learn to speak English, or if I was showing it to my son, I don't know, when he was four or five, forming his own language skills. You haven't got enough data on which to be able to answer that question. You wouldn't be able to decipher that at all. And this is how crucial the data is to getting the right kind of performance of the algorithm. Now, there's another side to this, and it's actually the way that we get the algorithms to learn. And it's a technique called reinforced learning. So every time the algorithm gives us the result that we like, we reward it. We give it points. We weight its sort of activity such that it looks for more examples because it wants to get another reward. Great example of this being done uh, with chickens. So every time the chicken does something that we want, so pecks on the pink disc, we reward it with some food. This is absolutely how algorithms work. And what I would love you to consider, just as a sidebar for a second, is if you see the two human beings in this video, let's call one Google and let's call the other Facebook. Who do you think the chicken is? 
Yeah, right, exactly. It's us, like we're the bloody chicken. Every time we do something that Google wants us to or Facebook wants us to, we get a reward. We hit the like, we click on the blue link, everything happens. This is reinforced learning. But if we reinforce the wrong kind of learning, if the data that we're using is biased, well, then we're reinforcing the wrong kind of behavior. Now, bias is a classically human issue, right? We as human beings, we walk around, we carry around 188 separate cognitive biases that frame and shape not just how we behave, but how we interpret the world around us. And so you can see it's inevitable that these biases find their way not just into the data that we generate to train the algorithms, but also in the questions that we ask the, the algorithms to solve. So let me give you an example of this. This is an example called geographical bias. Um, so let's say I'm creating an algorithm to spot fire engines, right? The first thing we need to know is what colour are fire engines. So ladies and gentlemen, you can play this at home just because I can't hear you doesn't mean you don't need to shout out at the TV or your device, whatever you're watching on. So what colour are fire engines? Yeah, of course, they're red. Well, actually, they're not red. It depends. They are red in the UK, but in other parts of the world, they're different colours. In Hawaii, for example, they're yellow. Now, why is this important? Well, if you're writing an algorithm who's designed, you know, whose job it is to spot fire engines on the public highway, you kind of need to know the geography where the algorithm is going to be used, otherwise the algorithm is going to be useless. Equally, on the other side of this, if you're in the market to buy an algorithm that's able to spot fire engines on the public highway, you kind of want to know who wrote the bloody algorithm, because it was, if it was written in Hawaii, and I'm going to use it in the UK, then it's probably going to need a bit of work because the geographical bias exists. But bias exists in so many things, and it's so important when it comes to algorithms. Now, I once had the, uh, just the honour and pleasure of being called to the Science and Technology Committee for the UK government, who are writing a, a white paper, green paper, sorry, on uh, the impact of robots and uh, artificial intelligence on UK society. And they assembled a panel of expert witnesses, and, and myself included. Uh, and and I, I think the, the term expert may have been slightly loosely applied, but we'll see. And they were asking really important questions. So they've got a panel of MPs. He's talking to a panel of scientists, and so we've got the, the MPs asking a question, can you explain algorithmic bias? To which my esteemed colleague, the professor in artificial intelligence, launched into a 25-minute monologue on Bayesian statistical theory, right? Fantastic and absolutely correct, but lost every single one of the audience. No idea what was going on. They kind of blacked out for a while, and then they came back in. So I said, look, it's a bit like this, right? Everything we do follows an algorithm. Making tea is an algorithm, and actually I'm a bit picky about the kind of algorithm that you use use to make tea. And I want to know if I'm going to order a cup of tea, if you're going to make a cup of tea, I want to know what kind of algorithm that you're using. Because if I don't, we end up in this kind of world. Hey guys, so I got a lot of questions after my last video and everyone wanted to see me make hot tea or British tea. So today we are going to make tea. So fill our mug with water, put it in the microwave, set it for a minute, pour the milk in, Drop your tea bag in, add the sugar, give it a little stir, and that's how you make hot tea. Just no, right? And you see, if I went to an establishment and that was their algorithm for making tea, there's no bloody way, right? This is the importance of algorithmic bias. It's not wrong that that algorithm exists to make tea that way. So it's okay for people. It's just not my way of thinking. So this is where we come to the accountability, the solution to algorithmic bias. There's three things we've got to think about. Number one, of course, the tech companies absolutely have a duty of care to ensure that not only are they doing their best to eradicate bias in the data, they're also doing the second thing, which is to make sure that the teams that they've got building those algorithms, developing those algorithms, are as diverse as possible. Only through diversity do we conquer bias. But there's a kicker, right? There's a third part to that, and that's us. We have a responsibility as consumers of those algorithms, assuming the tech companies have done their bit, right, done what they should, We've got to say to ourselves, I go, this is the algorithm I want to use. Now, what do I know about this algorithm? Where was it made? Who made it? What was the bias that might exist in the people who made the algorithm? Because it will infer my, my actions. It will help me decide the best course of action. So if we can do that, if we can get the tech companies in the right place, if we get diverse teams with data that's as free as possible from bias, but equally we play our part, we are accountable for how we choose to use those algorithms and understand that bias. Bias. That's how we get rid of algorithmic bias, and that's how we get algorithms exactly where they should be, which is to support us, to extend our reach, to enable us to do more than we could do on our own as human beings. That is the opportunity that lies in front of us. I've been Dave Copeland. Thank you so much for joining us.